Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Now that there's more people here that I don't know, I'll introduce myself. Um, <laughs> my name is Dave Mantis, Director of the University of Ministry. I appreciate you coming out in this crazy weather. For what I, I imagine will be a uh, very enlightening and engaging evening. Just one note, um, after the presentation tonight, if you'd like to um, read a copy of the Charter for Compassion and then add your name, your signature to the list of dozens of UDM faculty, staff, and students who have already done so, you can find a table right outside of our office up these stairs. Um, please feel free to take a copy of the Charter. We're highlighting this, this uh, document at Celebrate Spirit tomorrow at Callahan Hall. So please feel free to take a copy and add your, add your signature. So our, our speaker tonight, I first heard of uh, Dr. Keshavar, she was interviewed by Krista Tippett on a show called On Being on NPR. Um, and I found myself fascinated by her enthusiasm and love for Rumi, the 13th century Muslim mystic and poet. Um, she, she clearly has a passion for poetry, but also a passion for peace and justice, which make a, an excellent combination here for the University of Detroit Mercy. As far as her biography, Dr. Keshavar is the director of the Roshan Institute of Persian Studies and holds the Roshan Institute Chair of in Persian Studies at the University of Maryland. She's the author of award-winning books, including Reading Mystical Lyric, Reciting the Name of the Red Rose, and a book of literary analysis and social commentary titled Jasmine and Stars, Reading More Than Bolita in Tehran. Dr. Keshavar is a published poet in Persian and English and an activist for peace and justice. She was invited to speak at the UN General Assembly on the significance of cultural education. And the NPR show that I mentioned before, The Ecstatic Faith of Lumi, brought her the Peabody Award in 2008. And that same year, she also received her Herschel Walker Peace and Justice Award. So we're ecstatic to have her here tonight. So please help me welcome Dr. Fatima Keshavar. I could not imagine life without poetry. 
you know, it, it, it was everywhere. Um, it wasn't highly specialized art, although there were people who specialized in it, and you could listen to them, and they would be speaking about it very intelligently. And others would relate to it, maybe not on that high level, but it didn't belong to any particular expert. It was everyone. It was a part of life. The only thing I can really compare it to in our current environment here is when I sometimes say this, um, and actually in a, in a book that was just going to come out about the poetry of Sadi of Shiraz, one of the great master lyric writers of my hometown. I call this poetry the information superhighway of the Persian speaking world. It was a net of ideas, of thoughts, of philosophies, of information that these people share and could get connected to and hear each other's voice. Um, in a slightly less technological and more romantic, you could call it the Silk Road of the imagination, because it really connected China to the Mediterranean. You could go somewhere, let's say you were going to the city of Bukhara or Samarkand, or you were going to a place in Tajikistan, and you were traveling from Isfahan. You knew that if you have a beautiful Qatar study by heart, that someone over there is going to recognize you. Um, if you knew it at a specialized level, you might be even invited to give a lecture. You might be even invited if you wrote your own poetry and you were really good at it, the local ruler might even be interested in having you in their company and, and um, in the company of the people who came to, to see you. So it was there on that level. And, I, uh, uh, and it connected us over the centuries and time in ways that maybe not so easy to describe. Let me give you an example. If my mother was very upset with something we had done, she would look a little bit, you know, angry and say, have yet now after all, should yet the contact of the death. Which means trying to discipline a rascal is like trying to balance a walnut on top of a dog. <laughs> it's, it's so sad. It's a, it's a famous, famous line of Sadi who got at some point frustrated with the students and wrote this in one of them. Now, I heard this from way before I knew who Sadi was, until then I was really interested in reading Sadi. But something else that was in that poem was that, you know, in that roaming down of the walnut from the dome, there was a kind of laughter. You knew that. I knew that my mother wasn't really that angry. You know, it just, this connection of the beauty of the words, the laughter in there, and at the same time, the lesson that, um, that it gave was that complex. And I think one of the most important things that came out of this web of ideas is that the readers and the speakers of this language, they were able to imagine themselves as members of a community which was larger than the poverty in which they live. Why? Because Sadi had said, See, the lands are, are numerous and people in them are men. And he had traveled 30 years of his life. So um, he knew it's, there's a war of it out there. It's complex. And your step, your being, had to be humble in the presence of this being. It was not fashionable, and I'm sure there were many bad fashionable things, but it was not fashionable to just focus on your individual self and be the greatest being in the world. But it was fashionable to be a self that was humbled by the presence of the others and acknowledge them, seek knowledge and learning from them, and disseminate any kind of knowledge you would have. Now, I was telling my gracious host today that I consider myself extremely lucky 
that television came to our house when I was probably 14, 15. So I had been asked to stay for these poets every night. They came from, you know, 12th century or Khorasan or next door. Somebody was reading something, somebody was reciting something, somebody was having an argument with somebody and copying the line. And, you know, so it happened all the time. And so way before I started to read Julia Kristeva or, um, I don't know, many, you know, Michel Foucault or, or others, I knew that good poetry is that which frees itself from the page and becomes a part of your life. If it stays in prison in a book, there's something wrong. Or it's just not, you know, it's not up to the task, it's not able to do the job. Also, there were other ways. You know, you go to the um, bazaar, the fabric bazaar, why? Yeah. The merchant had a beautiful line, ring out and frame and put on the wall. Or you went to the class to practice something, you, you got these lines. But the family part of it was really important to me. I'll give you another example from my mother because I particularly got the love of poetry uh, of Sadi from my mother. And my mother was a very reticent, fairly reserved individual. And I don't want to give the impression that the older and distant mothers are like that. But she was. To her, you didn't express your love in words so much. You would give someone a sweater. You would cook them a nice dish. You would do something like that because if you really used your word, it somehow took away from the value of this emotion. So I always activated, really created the situation where we could have a game of mushayri or poetry. So my mother would recite Sally because then she was a different person. It would be the most beautiful, the most special, the most open words of a poet. And it was perfectly all right for her to have the voice of Sally and the voice of herself go and speak in that new voice. And Sally is a quite, quite actually an attractive figure, I think. When um, David heard me, I was very much in the roomy mode, and uh, I still am, but I sadly is definitely a very, very, um, but what he got my program in the way. Um, the, I'm very, very much now also a sadly person because um, what he did with his poetry, again, went beyond just teaching a few philosophical points. He had a great sense of humor. Would say to the beloved, I'm broken hearted for you. I'm not going to go to anyone else. You cannot mend a broken golden, golden vessel, the glue. So he was the, the gold vessel. He himself, he was way um, away from um, the kind of pale, heartbroken, helpless lover that we sometimes imagine that the very poetry of the time had. So this is one of my mother's favorite I translated. Someday I will find my way to those lovely curls. Of your sweet lips alone, I will tell a hundred savory tales. Do you wish to be in kind? Here, I have only one life, considering yours. Or if you wish to stay, I'll spread it like a carpet beneath your feet. Repentance and restraint are not the way to reckon with your love. From this moment on, I promise to never repent. You say, sit in sorrow till the end of your days, or rise and give yourself to love. Whatever you say, my dear, I'll sit and rise, and sit and rise. Without you, paradise, is a place I will not go near. If in hell, 
you are with me. I do not mind its blazing fire. So, this voice, the voice of Saggy, also criticized kings. It also praised some kings. It gave the most ethical lessons. Um, it made fun of himself. He, he says that he was a young child, he had a young 12 year old, 12, 12, 13 year old, and he used to get up very early and do the early morning prayer, Muslim prayer, which has to be done before dawn. And one day he was so pleased with himself that you know a lot of people in the house were sleeping, his father was up and he was praying. So he turns around to his father and he says it in a very literary, gracious way. None of these folks rise to offer a humble morning prayer to the Lord. So deep are they in their heedless slumber that they might as well be dead. And the father does not waste a moment. He says, if you have risen to spy on others, judging by what you just said, you too, my dear son, would be better off in bed. So it's really the kind of ethics that, well, this is, this is criticizing the kind of pretentious practice that says, if you don't pray every, if you miss a single prayer, you're not a proper Muslim. Or if you um, see someone, you have the right to judge them and say they're not good and so on. So he really, with, with these very loving words that you see in his lyrics, at the same time, you can see that he demolishes these false constructions of piety and self-praise and, and, uh, and social grand grandness and the embodiment. I think you, if you ask me what came out of those um, years, and obviously I went to the study of literature, I did a PhD and I'm teaching it, so clearly that was something that I fell in love with and followed in, 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 a, in a serious way. But, um, but if you ask me what is one really important thing you think about poetry, I will go back to what I said about the peace community. Poetry is engaged with life. You may learn a set of, uh, you know, and you say this actually about art in general, you can learn a set of techniques and try to do them very well. You can even do scholarship without being heavily involved or with the scholarship is also engaged. Um, but you cannot write green poetry unless you are engaged in life. And you're asking significant questions, which I think is another point I would like to really bring up in relation to the poems, and that is I would define one such thing as looking with intent look at life with intent. To see the smallest things around us and realize that they matter and that life is about the smallest components of it. Now, I think we are brought up, and I, 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 we, I don't just mean here in the American community, everywhere almost in the world, we are brought up with this desire to carry impossible acts of bravery and heroism, which could be good, you know, one could do it, but very often um, they're impossible. They're impossible, so therefore we give our heroes supernatural powers, they can fly, they can hide in ways that, you know, ordinary people can't. And therefore we always that we're so far from being that hero. I want to read you a poem, which I actually one of the first poems I ever wrote in English because it took me a long time. I was in this country for about 20 years before I wrote my first poem in English, and I never know why someday I gave myself the permission to do it. Maybe my children grew up and became enough of the, you know, of the, in, of the real natives, I don't know that that word, but actually culturally belonging that I felt I could use. Um, that I but this is one of the first things I wrote. It is about lighting a fire, the size of a flower pot. 
big enough to warm a single room, perhaps. A few cold fingers and toes now and then, and a frozen heart once in a blue moon, if luck gives a helping hand. Tis about being here. Tis about being here in the true sense of the word, with a kind of unwavering attention that does not leave a blade of grass unnoticed. It is about taking the time to deliver a piece of cake to a not so poor middle class family whose collective memory has been invaded by tuition, rent, insurance, and antibiotics, and realizing that even pastry shops around the corner can be forgotten permanently. It's not about disclosing the world of poverty, though it would be good if someone did. Or battling hunger, disease, and ignorance in those whose mass misery is a mirror in its horrendous clarity, reflecting the, the greed of a gluttonous view. Some things are hard to acknowledge. Tears are for those who are beyond hope today. But anything short of stunned silence is disrespectful of those who have no place in which to die. And there are those who do not have no place in which to die. And they die in the street. Some things are simply annoying for ants. Mountains do not define the horizon. It is not about heroes. Single acts of heroism and bravery raise too much dust. Think of the resulting poor visibility and all the cleaning to be done after. It is about letting life flow through you. It is about letting life flow through you with the kind of glow kind of fresh, vibrant smile that can only fit on a most ordinary day. The kind of shy, unpretentious reaching out that comes from living a mass bigger than your own body, which is about is probably very much addressed to us and to those of you who will be in classroom, inshallah, someday soon. Um, because many of us feel that these classrooms have to be brought to life. Just the same way that book poems need to be out of books and in real life, education needs to be brought to life by connecting um, aspects of our lives which are easy to leave behind, to be anxious about, to be depressed about, to be unable to voice that it isn't a part of the public, it isn't a part of the education to go through. Now be surprised if you, if you like, but I think, I really think that the humanities will be the crown of our university not so very long a time because we need it. We absolutely desperately need and we need to be teaching these in order to be able to live meaningful, wholesome lives that are connected to our education system. And then part of teaching poetry, I realized that one can one can look at the ideal situations and hope that that would happen for us in the classroom. But, um, but I want to give you an, an example of something that happens in the classroom and that has been very rewarding to me. And for the past 10 years, I have taught a course called um, Lyrics of the Mystical Love, Peace and West. And we basically 
go to the classroom and say, what is this? Stop reading on cognition, understanding of something that's a concept that's so far from a world in which we live, in which science wants to unravel everything. And please don't think I'm anti scientific. We absolutely love all those wonderful scientists that we have. But this urge to unravel to never allow ourselves to be perplexed, to never allow ourselves to say, what is before me is really larger than me, and I come over by and I'm perplexed. So we address that and try to read, try to read from different angles. Um, we talk about poetry, about voicing your visions, voicing your love for life, or your love for God, you know, depending on who we are reading and we keep reading all these poets along the way. And then we ask a question, why is it that all these mystics who talk about silence write so much So 
It was like I didn't have a flight to go there. It was tough. Some halfway through said, you know, the nightingale said, oh, I'm a lovely rose. I have to stay here. Um, another one said, Mutimar um, said, I am sad. I have to sit and watch my sea. I can't travel. I don't have the energy. So these are all our type. Okay. They get there. When they get there, to see the Simon or this legend of the world, there is no word there. There is a mirror. There's some kind of a luminous presence. And in that presence, they see themselves. But interestingly enough, in Persian, they are see more, which means 30 birds. In Persian, see means 30 and more means birds. So they are see more, but they are see more. In other words, they can only be their own truth. The book was not going to tell them who the truth is, the, the truth king is, and you know, so on and so forth. So the same if these ideas come out of the class. And so in one of the classes at the end, I said to the students, okay, um, actually it was last year, I said, okay, say something about the class. It, you don't have to be profound, you don't have to be mystical, you just say something about it. Somebody said, this course was about my life. It was about the questions I had. Another person said, in the discussion, I learned so much from my peers. I had no idea they could teach me so much. The student said, in my science classes, the correct answers are clearly defined. Here, we often had many different answers. So this was a um, computer science major. Um, another student said, I thought about material attachment, about my life being cluttered with things. Another student said, this was a PhD student, actually they would take it and they had to do extra work. Halfway through the course, I realized we were tackling some really complicated concepts. The readings were pretty hard, but everyone, even the undergrads, <laughs> seemed to understand them. We did, of course, take very small pieces and put a bit apart, and, and these poets were great in giving you um, tangible examples. There is a, um, there is a medieval um, Persian mystic who says, um, anyone asks me if that there's a difference between Muslim and a Christian and a Jew and a, you know, and I don't, you know, they, they don't understand me when I say um, there is no difference. Okay, imagine there's a circle and we are on the circumference and we are moving towards the center. Uh, oh, and they say, why are we so different from one another? The further we are from the center, the further we are also from each other. The closer we get to the center, the closer we get to each other. And if we get somewhere, you know, there is no difference between us. Then we understand. So they use a lot of such allegorical language. And one thing that I really um, highlighted in the class of this was the significance of hope. You cannot be engaged unless you keep the hope alive. And if you realize <coughs> the biggest dictators, the worst kinds of people who do the most horrible things, one of the things they try to do is to destroy hope, to say that whatever you do, you're not going to get it. Well, the mystics said the opposite. The one they said, there's a great anecdote about Rumi that one day he was sitting with some of his disciples around him. He did that in the garden very often. He put their feet in the water. They sat there and talked. And someone was not talking, so he said, you know, we're so, so not talking today. And somebody said, um, your holiness, or whatever they called him, he sat. So he thought for a second, and then said, what has sadness got to do anything with us? That thief was hanged at my threshold a long time ago. Now, they used to hang thieves at the threshold of the king of the palace, so that everyone knows who has the authority to, you know. But it's, when you think about it, it's such a precise metaphor. What does sadness do? Steals your energy. 
it exceeds your ability to do things. And so with these metaphors, with these um, step-by-step use of language, students come to actually see these are tools, very important tools about rebuilding their lives. And you know, I, there's one image that I absolutely love about um, that Louis has used in one of the sermons. He says, each one of us is a Mary, and we have a Jesus inside. If we don't give birth to our own Jesus, they will happen. It's connected to the truth. But we will be the man with the God. We have to carry this pregnancy with goodness and truth to terms and give birth to our own truth. And he does it with language because that's how these bridges are built. <coughs> Understandings are shaped, struggles take place, and ultimately meaning is created, is generated. One of the struggles we have in that class is that language is not a suitcase. It does not carry meaning for you. You can't open it and take the meaning out. The meaning generates in your interaction with the text. You are part of the generator of this meaning. And therefore, you are the creator in something. You have your ready with your own Jesus in the world. And so let me um, end by a poem that um, I dedicated to the students of that class. And it is called When a Poem Comes Your Way. I beg you to leave behind your imagined suitcases, to give up the thought that words carry pieces of meaning inside them, the way one's luggage carries one's shirt, shoes, or underwear. I want you to play at the meaning as it comes at you from unexpected corners, the way kids play with their new ball without a single care about hitting the most respectable glass window in the neighborhood. There is a kind of boom, a juvenile for the joy in breaking things that mesmerize you with their homes, words, thoughts, and ideas in the basement. Particularly when their sharp edges threaten to cut the skin and watch for the treasures that emerge from the ruin. I want you to walk barefoot on the sidewalks of life, the way intoxicated dervishes walk on pieces of broken glass or burning coal. I want you to live as if every ray of light flows in your veins, as if every leaf falls at your feet, and every bird can pull you up to the sky. I want you to listen. I want you to listen as if every blade of grass is singing, and talk as if the world is listening. When a poem comes your way, I want you to run your fingers along the uneven edges of its concreteness. Inhale its aroma, taste its bitter anguish, and walk with its comforting flow. There comes a time when you learn to be hungry for listening. Why not swallow poems whole, the way all constrictors swallow their prey? and live on it through the wintry hunger games of thought. Truth be told, I want you to become pregnant with a poem for a while, for as long as you need, for what 
is your gestation period, then give birth to your own need as if you conceive. As if there never was another poet in the world. I want you to be the lead. from hermeneutics 
of suspicion. We can't give it up. Anything you say, people are looking for a true value in that. Can I factually prove this? Okay, that's one way. That's one way of approaching life. But there are many, many, many other ways. There are stories that have no connection with truth, but have guided lives, have saved lives, and have built lives. Should we ignore them? You know, so, or, or even she talks about you know, looking at Christianity, those who are the opposite, you know, who are, who are very critical, are always looking at how can we prove this? In fact, people do this about Islam or any other religion. And um, she has a book that I would actually highly, highly recommend. It's called Mysticism and Resistance. Um, and in which she talks at, at, it looks at a huge range of um, methodological approaches that address limitations that come from, I would call it actually scientism, not really scientific, because scientific would be broad enough. It would take into consideration the non, other, you know, all the other aspects of faith. Um, so I, I, I would think that the, just bringing those um, wise voices from within tradition, I am in the same class. I teach the word probability to none, called Joan Chippester. Some of my students are like, why is she reading the order? You know, why is she reading it to none? You know, why? Because it's that binary opposition. I didn't know I could learn. And to say yes to everything and every question, everything is the idea they have. Or you are a questioning activist who want to go out and change society, and then what business do you have to be a nun? For years, I didn't know how to really solve this. Well, of course, I did not one of the books we read. She says, I stay because I made the church better, and the church makes me better. But the way I finally solved that was that I found a 10-minute um, um, presentation she had, and she has this beautiful Irish accent, and she said these jokes, really funny jokes. And suddenly, for, for the students, she became a real person. They listened to her. <laughs> so it is really about finding a multiple, you know, multi-tier methodology of bringing in um, approaches that show us that there is no either or. We have to be open up. So I, I hope I can. Returns to uh, 
that are trained that says, now I'm going to go, I'm going to forget about you and go back to my own business. But this repeats about maybe 20, 20 different stanzas come. And he shows us 20 different funny ways to arrive at this conclusion in a poem which is only on that subject. In the poetry of Rumi, actually laughter is the greatest spiritual impulse. He, he says maybe the universe is, that he compares the life of the universe into bursting into laughter. In fact, any kind of dynamic force presence in us or in nature around us, which isn't so easily manipulated by us, including laughter, or him as a spiritual dimension if we harness it properly. And you know, um, there is a, there was a tradition of praising kings and tradition of reminding them of their limits. And the funniest thing is that the greatest critical moments come come in those places. Just because if they if the poet started writing you know, starting from the beginning, you're such a terrible king, you're not, you know, just home, you would not probably see the light of day, or not very many people would dare um, read it and what publish it and so on, right? Because of whatever, publishing. But the poem would begin with the beauty of nature, and this nature meets a great um, kind of commander ruler, a just one, who realizes that life is short for everyone, including him, and coming gradually to what are the ways of staying in power of you, just what foolish things you can do, and any again, well, thank God, you realize as a, as a proper ruler, you realize. So there is a huge body of this literature which has been almost entirely ignored by critics because they thought this was literature of praying. This was just giving, you know, free reign to the holders of power. Um, there's, and then there are many, many other anecdotes. I mean, there's an anecdote in which Sadi gives us a King who's singing in a palace and you know to say that there are no one the world was ne ne never be this beautiful. I don't have a single thing to worry about, no sorrows. And then someone from outside the palace says, Well, if you don't have anything to worry about, maybe you should worry about me. And then the conversation begins between them in what Sadi does. And I wonder for a long time. How did this homeless person outside the palace survive so much in this literature? Because he uses the same elegant, educated, intelligent language that you find, in fact, is more compelling than the king when he talks. So the, the, the tradition has many different ways of bringing that this up. Um, there is a collection of uh, short poems, quatrains of Rumi. Um, called the Unseen Rain. If you don't have it, that's a very good place to look for all these new monsters and um, funny things, wise things. It's very, very useful if you put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Just as you began your remarks about the peace community that was up in the context of the concerns about the Iraq War, possible war with Iran, and I had a chance to read one of your poems that I found online that were a very touching poem about soldiers in Fallujah. Yes, soldiers and the people they interact with. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about how do you write a poem about such a 
sensitive and difficult situation, and what role do you see poetry in when we're trying to help our community reflect on war and the impact of war in the humanities? No, I think one of the biggest disasters that could happen or begins to happen is when we separate ourselves from the other side, whether that is if it's a war or conflict, and um, thinking to only focus on what is happening to us. And I, I always found it very, very sad when I was at airports and I would see young soldiers, you know, flying to be in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever they were. Um, and particularly ever since I worked with the um, peace community and, and I worked with veterans for peace. And there was a um, wonderful gentleman, a, a veteran of the Vietnam War, and we had a routine tradition of crying together because he would be telling me something about the latest thing that case of a, a PTSD or um, you know, an assault on a woman uh, in the army, or whatever it was. And it would be got usually to a point where it was really hard to see. And I kept thinking, no, that's not right. Why should you speak about it? And to me, a mother whose son has lost an arm or a leg or died is as much a war prisoner as someone who may be put in Guantanamo. So, unless we, you know, and he's very emotional, I can hardly read that poem myself. Um, but it, it actually came up, and once when I was uh, traveling to the campus, probably in Michigan, actually, and, um, and I wasn't going to be a part of the presentation that I did read, and there were so it, it just there are moments where you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. I think poetry is about accepting your weakness, which is the source of your strength. So you know at the times when you just have to look at these wounds that you are suffering from, and I see that as the only way we have, you know, to look at Israel and Palestine as if they were. Exact same place, even though you know a lot of people say, you know, even that's okay. The army that one side has it, these things, these details may be true. The people who are suffering in this, we have to see them on the same level. It's called uh, Giggling in Fallujah, and so if you want to look it up tonight. Yes, uh, coming back to the, the question, uh, very often people think if you are spiritual, um, you shouldn't be angry, you shouldn't be protesting, you shouldn't be out in the streets. Um, it's almost like anti-spiritual to do that. Um, I know that we mentioned high hierarchy and holiness want you to be, not you to be exclusive. But um, how do you really get this across that you would be out there protesting, saying poetry, in the, reciting poetry in the streets, and also be deeply spiritual at the same time? Well, that's the point that came up with Joan Chittis, that everyone thought if she was a good nun, she, wouldn't, she shouldn't be really showing dissatisfaction for the way the society treated certain people and certain classes of people and, and so forth. Well, my solution, I mean, I think it took a while for me to give myself permission to express those things. I think um, the example of it is if you are a loving mother, you sometimes may really say something that is hard to hear. You may have to do that. If you are, you know, like, loving relationship with your husband, partner, and whether you may sometimes do things that appear to be hurting that 
you can't be anything but what the truth is skill you need to express. I think what poetry can do is coming together in loving peaceful groups is that from the beginning they rule out violence. To me, that is essential. If you rule out violence, you say, I am not going to hurt. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to be destructive. Then I think that being angry, being dissatisfied, being outraged at some things that happen are very compassionate and very spiritual. Um, because you can't do it without you can't do it without that force. I mean, Ruby says about the force of love, he says it's destructive. The door is never stationed. He says, you know, um, think of yourself as a child. See, you were a child who could only think about food and drink and comfort, and you grew up and there were more perceptions and thoughts. When you were older, you know, the, your body, your existence accepted all of these. When you were older, King Love comes in and looks at you and says, this is no palace. I don't want to leave palace. It takes you apart and builds a palace out of you. So he doesn't talk about love as if this, it was this rosy, you know, comfortable, uh, <coughs> with no need to express outrage or rebuild himself in, in that way. So I see it as very spiritual, and I think as long as you know you're not going to be violent, then. Can we take one more question? I can see in Kern's face, he's going to ask a question. Very simple question. Have you read the Leash Fox, The Forty Rules of Love? The, the Forty Rules of Love? No, I haven't. You should, you should read it. It's all about. I'm not sure. I'd love to hear. I wish I could hear your take on it. It's all about uh, Rumi. It's all about Rumi. What is the name of the poet? Um, it's not a book of poetry. She's a novelist. Okay. So what is the name of the author? Elise Shabbat. Elise. Okay. I'm going to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you all join me in uh, thanking Dr. Kishimura for her presentation?